So I'll talk a bit about history, how I got here, and my experience with multi-platform development and Redux, Redux uh, Saga, uh, and conclusion. Just a bit about me. Currently, I manage here uh, the vertical car restaurants, Wix restaurants. Uh, we create solution for restaurants. Prior to that, we were OpenRest, which I'll talk about in a second, a small startup that did solutions for restaurants. I worked in Unavo, if anybody knows the company, they were sold to Facebook, they had an app. Um, that's basically the history. Uh, about six years ago, uh, me and a co-founder, Danny, who's sitting there, started a company called OpenRest. What we did were online solution for restaurants. Restaurants would come to us, give us a bit information, their menu, where they're located, things like that, and they would get an online ordering website. And that was great. We had about 200 restaurants in Israel. If you order from or, uh, takeout from Tel Aviv, it's from our old system. And at some point during 2012, we decided we want to go to mobile. And we wanted to create apps. And why did we want to go to mobile? This graph explains it. Basically going to February 2014 and later today, 50% of orders, online orders from restaurants are from mobile. We're basically really lazy. We sit on the couch, we don't go to our computer, we take our cell phones and we order. And we know apps uh, would solve this much better than web, uh, than mobile web, and I'll touch it in a second. So we decided to create uh, apps for restaurants. Um, the, st the first stage were native apps, iOS, where I'm talking before Swift, Objective-C, if anybody still programs with that. Just apps where you can select your dishes and uh, go through a checkout process, really plain apps. Uh, but the thing about us is that we were facing the decision of how to solve Android. Our iOS apps worked great. They were selling, restaurants put them online, people were ordering from them, and we had to decide how to develop Android. Now, the thing about us is that we hate when people tell us what to do. So for that reason, we never took an investment. We were two people we, who had about 400 apps in the store, about that many restaurants working with us, constant bugs, constant new features, and uh, going to Android and going to a third uh, programming language, Java, just seemed overwhelming for two people. We already had JavaScript for web and mobile web, and now to have it for... Uh, to have iOS and to have Java, that wasn't a solution. So we looked at different solutions, like most of you have probably already done so. And basically, you can start with web apps. I'm sure all of you thought, hey, let's code share the easiest way, do a web app. Um, I'm guessing you all know what that means. So just wrap your uh, mobile web with an app uh, using either phone grab, jQuery mobile, the, the entire works. Uh, the issue there for us specifically was uh, performance. We wanted users to have a smooth feeling. When you order online, the smoother the, the feeling, probably you'll order a bit more, you'll return a bit more, it'll mean the restaurants get more revenues, so smooth feeling was important to us. I have to say that a lot of companies, I know I'm going to say something a bit on the evil side, a lot of cases where it's not important to have that smoothness, today web apps are good. They're not perfect, uh, but they're good. But that was important to us. So we went to Titanium Accelerator. Who here knows this? This is basically React Native minus 0.5 in version. Um, lets you write in JavaScript, runs as JavaScript on the computer, but every single command you give it, like create a button, create a view, is translated to the, OS, to the iOS or to the Java or to the Android, and the uh, object itself is native. So you get the native filling and you write JavaScript. Today, after a lot of years with Accelerator, we're upgrading to React Native. Now, in order to be able to code share the most, we had to invent a new way, a new framework to how to develop in Accelerator Titanium. We took with us to React Native and Redux pretty much uh, obsolete that because they do exactly uh, what we do. Just so it's clear why we, why we decided React Native eventually, uh, the same code across all platform, 
the same business logic. We have exactly the same business logic, and I'll talk to it about a second in a second. Uh, we continuous deploy. This is something that most of you do today if you do apps. In our, in our era, uh, the 2013, it was the gray area. Apple said you can't send code to users. We constantly send code to users. We constantly updated the app. And the reason we could do it is because the app was JavaScript. Today, you do it with code push. And uh, you have advanced debugging tool, React Hot, uh, time travel. We talked about it in a second. Uh, and of course, the result is very, very close to pure, pure native. Where does it fail? In the sense of a single thread. If you have a large uh, operation that you do, uh, for example, if you decide to calculate the entire uh, uh, numbers until trillion, uh, and in the middle of the user press a button, they'll feel a lag. But it's a pretty, cure, uh, pretty close to pure native. So how did Redux help us share code across our entire platform. You all know React. You have a render function, receives props and states, gives us a virtual dome. You all know this system. Redux, I'll touch a bit, because there are some people who, do, who don't know the idea behind it, so I'll touch it a bit. Basically, the idea of the flux is separate between your logic and your view. You have stores, which contain, which hold your app's state, the, which screen is the user on, what's uh, the input they give to your uh, question, what's their name, things like that. Um, you pass that information, the state, to your React components. Your React components look at the state and then uh, display the state on screen. Their entire process in life is to display the state. And using actions, action, uh, you update the store with the new state. That's general, re uh, adjust, that's general flux. Redux goes another step. You have one state. Your app is one state. Everything that happens is one uh, state that you can uh, serialize. It's a serializable state. Your components, most, 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 most of your components should be dumb. What do, do I mean in dumb? I mean they're stateless. They don't know anything except the input that they're given. They don't hold a current state. Um, in old React, you have the set state function. We don't do that in Redux, no state. The entire state is stored in the store. Uh, you have smart components which connect to the store. And you have reducers that change the state and actions. I'm guessing you all know basically how it looks like. Uh, you initialize the store, as you know. Uh, the store, what Redux does, again, this is for the people who don't know the Redux, it passes something that calls a, that's named a context. So context, you have the props and you have the state. You also have a context, which is global props that are given to every single child. So the Redux provider gives the store as a context, which means that they give it as a, as a prop to every single child. And you can access uh, the store from every single component and dispatch actions. Uh, and things like that. There is something that is used commonly to make it a little bit easier, which is the connect mechanism. Actions just return a map of a type and some parameters, and the reducer's uh, task is to receive those actions and to change the state. The cool thing about Redux, as you all know, is time travel. Um, have you ever tried time travel in React Native? Has anybody tried uh, time travel in React Native? Excellent. There is a video right now that was released about a week ago of somebody who managed to do it really well with an ability to debug and go back. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, basically, you have all your actions. You can go back in history. You can change the state. You can update the, the state. And then you re-render. So it works well in React Native as well. I'd like to give you a little example of something. This is our online ordering system today. And what we have is you can select an item. And what I want you to see is the following logic. When I press order now, it shows this little screen. I tell them either I connect or I'm not a regular. And I continue as guest. And, that's, and I start the checkout. Something, something really simple. I have exactly this specific flow both in my web app as well. You go in, press checkout, it asks you this, and in my native app, both iOS and Android. 
this is a business logic of how things flow. Um, and how does the code for this look like in our case? This is Redux Saga. This code is a code that runs in our business logic. This is what manipulates our state. This is what receives actions from your view, either your web view or your native view, and changes the state of the system. First line, pretty simple, sends an action to the store saying, show the login screen. Okay, very simple uh, line. What it does is change the, states, the state of the store, saying current screen equals login screen. The state goes down to the components. The components then know to display the login screen. Next line tells it, now wait for either one of two events. Uh, a good uh, load successful, which is basically somebody logging in, or somebody pressing the continue as guest. Next line says hide the logging screen, hide that logging screen, and which again, fires an event to the, to the store, the store changes the state, and now the logging screen is hidden. And the last line says start the checkout flow. This is a code that sits in my Redux Saga. It works on both iOS, both Android, and everything, it changes the store, and is common. If I have a bug here, it's really, it's in one place I can fix it. The thing is that it's really readable. Although things are asynchronous, means, meaning that there are stops and things that need to happen, you can read it and it's pretty clear what the saga does. And what Redux Saga lets you do basically is write your stories, the things that, the flow of your system in one continuous block, not being aware of asynchronous or not asynchronous, and seeing exactly what you need to do. For example, this is really easy to see what is this flow. I don't have here any promises with then and things like that. I don't have here calling external function, waiting for actions, changing a state to wait for the action, things like that. This is really simple code. This is Saga. Saga lets you write the story of your app in one continuous flow. The story starts from an action. This block always starts from a single action. For example, in this case, it could be the clicking the checkout, and then the story has a flow and ends normally in putting actions to the store to update the store. This is really testable. As you can see it, I'm, I can test it really, really simple. I'll show you in a second. And this, is, this has changed the way we work and we write code completely. Now all our, all our logics are gathered in one single place, which is the Redux Saga, and are used across our entire platforms. Uh, anybody here works, has worked with ES7 generators? Okay, Saga uses ES7, ES7 generators, which is an advanced feature, uh, really complex how it works, so I don't ex won't explain it. But basically what you can do is write code that looks synchronous and yield. Yield means, this yield means I want to do something, return to me after you've done it. For example, this yield says put an action and return when the action has done. This yield says uh, wait for one of those actions and return when one of those actions have happened. So you could yield for sending another action, you can wait for action, you can create promises and yield for them to finish. So for example, I can yield for a fetch and I can merge and fork other sagas. Since that is the case, which, one, which I can do, it's really easily testable. We have a system where a saga pretty much starts with one store and ends with an action. So we have a test that simply gives the saga the store and waits until the saga ends and looks at what actions were fired and sees that the fact actions are uh, written well. So it's just, just as much as it's good to write your views pure of logic, you should write most of your logic, most of your business logic as sagas. Once you write them as sagas, you can use them across all platforms and it'll be a lot more easier for you to debug, to write, to things of, uh, like that. We took it a step for, further. Um, we don't have any reducers. Actually, it's my vision, we still don't have that, uh, but we're going this way. We don't have any more reducers. Uh, the saga updates the state itself. All tasks are in the saga. Um, the saga just simply tells the store to be updated, and that's it. All our logic in one place, testable, 
across all platforms. And that's basically it. Uh, when you want to write Redux, when you want to share code between all systems, put your business logic in one place, be the Redux. Uh, and I really personally uh, would uh, love it if you use Redux Saga, not because I have any investment, because I really think it improves the code and it improves the usability. That's basically it if you have any questions. The question is, if we removed reducers, is there any uh, performance issues, uh, performance advantages? Um, I'll answer it like this. If you have performance issues using React, you're doing something wrong. Um, there shouldn't be any performance issues with Redux and React whatsoever. Uh, so moving to reducer, uh, removing the reducers doesn't affect anything. If you have issues, then check that uh, your sh component should update is correct. Check that uh, p uh, components are using the right props and are waiting on the right props. Um, so there's no performance uh, advantages because it simply works. Uh, we don't have performance issues, hopefully. Comparison between Redux Sagas and Redux Thunk. Who here has you been using Redux Thunk so far? Excellent. I'll just show for a second what's Redux Thunk just so people will know. When you write actions in Redux, um, you sometimes want to do things asynchronous. Basically, you want things to happen not in the view, but as part of the action. Redux Thunk is a middleware. Middleware is an extension that lets us do it. We are, this is an action. How I call it is use dispatch fetch posts. Dispatch is a function of the store. I call store.dispatch with this. This returns a function. This function runs immediately, basically. And it has two parameters, dispatch and get state. Dispatch lets us dispatch another action whenever we want. And uh, get states give us the state. This is how we do async. This is the standard way to do async. Anybody who's using Redux with Redux Thunk, this is the way they do it. The disadvantage here is that actions can only be generated by the views. Basically, in, uh, in standard Redux Thunk, I can't do an action that is as a result of another action. For example, if I've received from a different company in Wix a login mechanism, a login, um, and I want to do an action as a result of their login action, I need to pass it through the store. I need the action to go to the store, st change the state to he's logged in. The views need to catch this state change and then fire another action, which is my action. Um, this entire circle of things that a business logic that uh, lets, the, lets the views trigger something is not a good business logic. Sagas solved this for us. Sagas let us do actions that are a result of different actions. And uh, basically, let us put in a full story, as I said, in comparison to Redux uh, Thunk, which is a very minimal solution uh, for that case. Um, any more questions? OK, thank you.